Hello, and thank you for joining with me for our final study in the Book of Psalms. We've looked at a number of Psalms, and I want to finish our study by looking at three final Psalms tonight. I did advertise I was going to look at four, but actually I think four would be taking it too much for one evening. And so I've decided we'll look at Psalm 100, Psalm 118, and Psalm 34. And the theme of tonight's study is giving thanks to our faithful God. And as per usual, uh, there'll be a time of prayer, but I'm going to leave the prayer to the end because I want to give thanks for the study and the word of God at the end of our evening before we finish this study. I also want to say that there will be some questions that, again, if you have never followed this, this Bible study, you can pause the questions and try and answer them yourself. And then I'll tell you what I think the questions say to me. And because they say it to me, it doesn't mean that what I say is right and what you feel is wrong. God is speaking to us through his word. And so he might be speaking to us coming from different perceptions, different traditions, different needs at this time. So if God says something to you in response to a question, don't say that because it's different from me, you're wrong or I'm wrong. God speaks to us through his most precious word. So our psalms today, as I say, we're going to look at Psalm 100. And that's a nice little short psalm. And because it's a short psalm, I'm going to read the entire psalm to you. But then we turn to Psalm 100, uh, 118. And that's a, a lengthy psalm. There's over 40 verses. So I won't be able to read it. I'll just give a sort of summary of that. But you can read it in your own time. And maybe you can pause the, 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 the recording at that point and read it before we look at some of the questions or I make some comments. And then we're going to look at finally Psalm 34 and depending on time I might read the whole lot but I don't think I will because again it's uh, it's there's more than 20 verses and it'll take a wee bit of time. So if you're sitting comfortably I'll begin and one of the things I don't like about this Bible study doing it this way is that I don't get a chance to respond to your comments or thoughts uh, but hopefully when we do our next Bible study, there'll be an opportunity maybe to sit face to face or we'll maybe try and do it on Zoom so that people can uh, respond and give me their thoughts uh, as we're going on rather than just sitting, listening to me for the next half an hour or more thinking about God's word in the Psalms. So Psalm 100. And I'm reading all my today are from the NIV Study Bible. Psalm 100 is a short psalm. It's only five verses. It's a psalm for giving thanks. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come, bow before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What wonderful words to start any study speaking about the faithfulness of God. And, and I want to just explore that notion with you a wee bit more about Psalm 100. Because for me, it's such, a, it's such an uplifting version uh, of, of Scripture. It's, it's, a, it's, a joyous, it's a joyous word. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, it says. Not just faithful folk. Not just believers. Not just the chosen few. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. And that's, a, that's such a powerful start. All the earth, everything. Remember there's a verse, everything that has life and health. Praise the Lord. So I want to, I want to think about this, Psalm 100. It's, it's, it's split into two parts. In my version of the Bible, it's, it's quite clear. There is verses 1 to 3, and then verses 4 to 5. 
and we'll look at these just in, in each bit. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. We're being told that we've got to be joyous in the Lord. And we've got to worship him with gladness. With gladness. I don't know how many times in the past when I was younger, and if I'm perfectly honest, not always uh, I'm perfect now, that I've gone along to worship. <sighs> I thought it was a chore. I've done it more out of duty than, than expectation. And it's a shocking admission that worship should not be a duty. It should not be an obligation. It should not be a, a, a support of your local congregation or your minister. Lovely that these ideas are. Worship should be about praising God, acknowledging what God has done for you and God is doing with you. So we should be coming, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Well, one of the sadness at the moment with worship is that we cannot sing together. I love belting out the hymns, often not in tune, more often than not, not in tune. But I love just singing with people. I love just this notion, even in small congregations like Clooney and Money Musk, of, of having people together. And one of the things that I really miss during worship while I play other people singing or on recorded music, it's not the same as us being able to come with joyful songs. But of course, worship is not always about joyful songs. Worship is also about contemplative music. It's about thinking what God has done. But here, in this psalm, we're coming to God with faithful songs. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. No that the Lord is God. And that's important. Know that the Lord is God. Now, these two words are, for us, the same, Lord and God. But God is supreme. And it says, why? It says, it is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. As I've said in one of my sermons recently, the church at Clooney has sheep and lambs beside it. And there's nothing l more precious than hearing the wee lambs bleating in the field right next to our worship. We think of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. We think of the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And here the psalmist is bringing that picture to mind. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We are his we are his, so we worship him. So that's the first part. It's, it's making us want to worship. A general, this is why you worship, because God made us, we are his. And then the second part is more about moving into the denominational worship, moving into the, the community of the worship, of worship. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. You get that image. Maybe you don't, but I do. The image of them going to worship in the temple, going through the big gates of the entrance with the walls surrounding the various courtyards as you come nearer and nearer the Holy of Holies. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks and praise his name. And here's the punchline for this psalm. So the Lord is God and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Sometimes at the moment it's, it's easy to, to think that perhaps God has left us. We're sinking. We're not sure what the future holds. We're surrounded in this fear of COVID and this fear of what's happening to our churches. But the psalmist, going through difficult times as the Jewish people did, would say, his faithfulness continues through all generations. So as has happened in the past with these Bible studies, there's three questions on, on this psalm that I want to look at with you. And the first one is, what is the predominant emotion in this psalm? What is the predominant emotion in this psalm? And if you want to pause it now and, and think about it or scribble it down, you can. 
The second question is, how does this psalm make you feel emotionally with, about God? And that's a personal response. I'll mention these questions again in a minute so you can, you can jot them down. And the final one is, what are the reasons for praise given in verses 3 and 5? And I said three, but there's actually four questions. And finally, what are the commands in this psalm? Excuse me, I'm going to be talking a lot and my throat's a wee bit dry. That's better. So the first question, what is the predominant emotion in this psalm? Well, for me, it's one of joy. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship him, come before him with joyful songs. So the emotion is one of joy. The second question, this is how I would answer it, in case you want me to say it again. How does the psalm make you feel emotionally about God? How does the psalm affect you as you're reading it? Me? I'll give you the answer. You've probably seen it in my face and in my voice. As I've been reading it, I have been bubbly, I've been buoyant. I've been joyous, recognising what God has done for me. Know that the Lord is God, that is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, the sheep are looked after. We are looked after by God, even in these strange times. And I've, all, oft, I've, I've almost answered the next question. What are the reasons for praise giving in verse 3 and verse 5? We are his in verse 3. And in verse 5, his love endures forever and continues through all generations. That's the two things that I would say. That's the reasons of, for praise. We're recognising that we are his and his faithfulness continues through all generations. And what, does the, what are the commands in this psalm? It's almost a, an English question, really. Shout. Worship. Come before him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Give thanks to him. That to me is, is what I would read, are the commands. Shout for joy. Worship the Lord. Know that the Lord, I probably didn't say that one, know that the Lord is God. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. These are all very important commands. Commands. For all of us. So let's let's move away from Psalm 100 and look now at Psalm 118. And as I've said, it's a, a long psalm. It's 29 verses or so. And so it's something that we'll maybe have to think about. I'll read it to you. I'll read it to you quickly. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but the name of the Lord I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they did, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. 
In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From your house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made the light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join the festival procession up the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. It really is quite a, a deep, it's quite a long, it's, it's, it's difficult for you to take it all in on just hearing me speaking, but it's quite a deep psalm. It's one that, that causes us to, to think about it, and how we're going to look at it. But I think it starts off with, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. It's a communal giving thanks. You know, we're being called to give thanks. Let Israel see, let the house of Aaron see, let those who fear the Lord see, his love endures forever. It's, it's all the faithful people. The house of Israel is, of course, the people, the, the, the Jewish people. The house of Aaron is the priest, the priestly people. And those who fear the Lord, that's all the rest. His love endures forever. So we are called at the start of this psalm for communal thanksgiving. And then in, that's the first four verses. And then from verses 5 through to 21, we are giving reasons for our thanksgiving. And it's quite a broad uh, it's quite a broad, st and it starts off with, In my anguish, I cried to the Lord. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid, it says in 6. The Lord is with me, he is my helper. Gives us reason to give thanks. And so it goes on. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to put your trust in man or in princes. There's a similarity of, each of the sort of verses has a, a phrase and then it's amplified. The same meaning, but it's that kind of given so you first of all don't put your trust in man, then you don't put your trust in princes. And it says, all the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. And it says that again, I cut them off, I cut them off. It was I was pushed back, I'm about to fall, but the Lord helped me. It's all about getting to the edge and then stepping back. It's all about the pressures you're under and then God being there. And then it says, Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. Again, it's that image of the gate of the court, going into the presence of God. I will give you thanks, for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. It's a wonderful, wonderful passage. And it's, it's, it's difficult. There's no ifs and buts about it. It's difficult to fully comprehend. But just as you're doing it, just think about this notion of journey. A journey in the faith. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. The whole nation, all peoples of faith, give thanks to the Lord. And then all the things that could have knocked you away from God, we're told that God is there. He hears your cries. He supports you. If you're being pushed over, he's there to collect. Not, not physically. Not 
actually there to hold you up. But he's there to hold you up with all the temptations and all the worries and all the stresses that come to the people of God. And you know, it's it to me is is wonderful. And then we get from verse twenty two, it's well known passages. Well known in the Christian community because it's it's quoted in the New Testament. It starts off it's it's a Thanksgiving liturgy. It's it's a way of this is how we use worship. Liturgy is, is structuring how we worship God. And so in he, this passage from roughly verses 22 to 29 is a liturgy of the thanksgiving that's in our heart for all these things that we've just looked at. These come out in worship. So in verse 22 it says, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. We know now who that is. Jesus himself described it as the stone the builders rejected. The Lord has done this. And it's marvellous. It's blooming marvellous. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our joint services very often include that phrase with our neighbours at the start of worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And in the, the, verse, the following verses, it kind of tells us why we've got... For the Lord grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The, the great Hosanna phrase from Jesus arriving in, in uh, Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. It's a lovely praise, excitement, joy. You are my God and I will give you thanks. You are my God and I will exalt you. How can we not? How can we not exalt our God? Whew. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Remember that the last psalm it finished with faithfulness endures through generations. His love endures forever. Let's see what the questions are for this one. And see how we can answer them. Oh dear. I should really have looked at these questions before I gave you my take on the psalm. Because the first question is, what does the stone the builders rejected, verses 22 to 23, have to do with the Messiah? I'll let you think about that. I hope, I hope that you know, but if you don't, that's okay. Because hey, as I've been studying these psalms, I find there's so much I don't know. And I've supposedly been trained in some of this stuff. So, the stone the builders rejected turned out to be the capstone. In Money Must Church, we have an arch. And it's built up of stones all the way up the arch and it curves into the top. And right at the top, there's one stone that holds it all together. It starts the downward pressure and the pressure holds the arch in place as the stone above the stone above the stone. If it wasn't for that central stone, it's shaped a wee bit like a V. Uh, it's, it's kind of like that shape and it sort of clips in. The stones are cut to fit in. And that just holds them all in place. Everything balanced as that while it was all put together in a wee bit mortar to hold it in. The capstone, the cornerstone. And the question is, what does the stone the builders rejected have to do with the Messiah? The stone that the builders rejected is that capstone that holds everything together. And we know that Jesus was rejected by his own people. His own people came to him and didn't look at John's uh, prologue to the gospel. It's Jesus who's the Messiah. He's the one that his own people didn't. And so they couldn't be complete without that capstone. And let's see what it says. It says, what does verse 25 to 27 have to do with the Messiah? Here's verse 25 to 27. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. 
and he has made the light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. What does that have to do with the Messiah? Well, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, I've already said, was the phrases that were used when Jesus came into Jerusalem. It's a well-known phrase in, in of worship, of recognition of those who come from God. Save us. Only the Messiah can save us. Only God can save us through his Son. And the Lord is God. And he has made the light shine upon us. This New Testament tells us, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We won't walk in darkness, but have his light. So that really makes us think about the next part of what it means to be led by Jesus, the Messiah. So Psalm 118 is a complex psalm, but at the end of it, it really sums up with, you are my God and I will give you thanks. You are my God and I will exalt you. And then we're, we're told, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And I'm quickly going to look at Psalm 34. Again, it's a 22 verses, but I'll just read it to you. And if you want to read it yourself, so much the better. Psalm 34. I'm just trying to find it on another passage here. I like to have a couple of different versions so that I can look at them and help me. So just bear with me while I go. Here we go. That's it. It's wonderful having a Bible and a wee laptop with the Bible on it. Psalm 34. And interesting, this says of David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. So this is the Psalm of David. Excuse me. I will extol the Lord at all times, and praise will always be on my lips. I shall will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look on him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The poor man called to the Lord, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord back to back. Uh, sorry, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. In the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them from them all. He protects all the bones, not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, the foes of the, the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants, no one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Oh, another one of complexity. Another one that takes a wee bit of thinking about. It speaks about the relationship of wisdom and thanksgiving. 
having the wisdom to acknowledge what God has done leads to thanksgiving. But it's not really an easy one to read, as you saw with me stumbling a wee bit, but also it's not an easy one to fully grasp all the images that are in it. And really at this point, I think sometimes you have to just let it speak to you as it is. I have the pleasure of and, and having uh, a, a thousand page book of the Psalms sitting on this computer in front of me as I'm talking to you. Not that I've read it all, I have to confess. But it's it's important sometimes that we see some of the images and try and understand because the audience that this psalm was written to is not necessarily us. And we don't grasp all the subtleties. But then with God, he speaks to us through his word. Sometimes we don't need to grasp all the subtleties. We need to trust in him. So let's look at this psalm a wee bit more. A psalm of David. That's the first thing it says. This psalm is generally categorised as an individual's thanksgiving hymn. But in the middle, it's, it's thinking not just about thanksgiving, but about wisdom. About the what the what the, the necessary as if the necessary gift of being wise to understand, and it's it's not easy in here, it's not easy in here, and it's certainly not easy on the page to follow. But it's important that I finish this study in the Psalms to say the Psalms are not all just happy clap here. They're not just all about uh, making us be you know, why oh Lord will you forget me forever. The Psalms are a mixture of, of head and heart and always soul. It makes us think about what we're reading. I will extol the Lord at all times. It's that, what a powerful pr way to start a Psalm. And all of these Psalms have had that notion of, not, of extolling, exalting, praising, giving thanks. His praise will be always on my lips. I wish I could say that. I wonder what about you. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Look, I can't do say exalt without lifting my hands. And yet when I'm in worship, if you ever want to exalt the Lord in worship and try to oh, put them in my pocket, don't don't get excited like this. But here I can't say, let us exalt the Lord. Let us Let's open ourselves. Let's praise God for what he's done for you and for me. And that puts a smile on my lips and a smile in my heart. I sought the Lord, it says in verse 4, and he answered me. And verses 4 to 7 are all about individual examples of God responding. The poor man called and the Lord heard him. The angel encamps around those who fear him. And delivers them. A wonderful set of, of opening acknowledgements and of for thanksgiving. And then from verse 8 to 22, we're kind of praising wisdom. Praising wisdom in the general sense and in the specific sense of being in the presence of God. You know, when I'm celebrating communion, Another thing I've missed doing in the face of the congregation, and in May, I'm hoping to be able to celebrate communion live in church. Uh, it's all the problems of sharing the bread and, and various things which I'm still battling with. But for me, there's nothing better than, this is my body broken for you, breaking a piece of bread. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed by my blood. And when I've, when I've dedicated and blessed the bread and wine, I then say to people, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I bet you didn't know that that came from the Psalms, that line. Well, I shouldn't be, of course, and I shouldn't be saying that because you probably did. But for years I didn't know. I thought it was just something that somebody said. Somebody thought this was a good idea, taste and see that the Lord is good because this is the body and blood of Christ, so taste and see the Lord is good. It actually comes from the book of Psalms long before the Last Supper was ever thought about. 
blessed is he, is the man who takes refuge in him. And then we're giving wisdom about the fear of the Lord. I went to Aberdeen University, whose motto is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here we're getting an, an, uh, an underlying hint of that. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Fear not in trembling, not in fear of judgment, but in fear of acknowledging that God is holy and good and kind and caring. And yes, we, we don't always acknowledge that. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil. Again, wisdom. It's about, you know, not saying the things that, that you should say. A friend of mine commented something on Twitter, uh, on Facebook rather, and I was going to make what I thought was a witty comment. And in my heart, it was a witty comment. It was a funny comment. But when I started to type it, I saw that it could be misconstrued. It could be misconstrued as possibly sexist or racist or both. It wasn't meant in these terms. But somebody could look at it out of context and, and lack of knowing me and how I speak. One has to be careful how one speaks, so I didn't post it. I wish more people on the internet actually thought before they posted what they post. It would make the internet a lot better place to be and social media too. But that's an aside. It says, I will teach you. Keep your tongues from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Fake news. Lies. Keep your tongues from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. It's all about wisdom. It's all about this notion of what's right and what is wrong. It's wonderful. It's challenging. It's frightening, uh, the things that we are being challenged with. But it's certainly, I'm just turning the pages, it's certainly something to make us think about. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive in their cry. He hears you. He knows you. He's watching you. Well, let's have a wee think just about some of the questions. The first question, it says, Why should we praise God continually? Wow. Why should we praise God continually? I've said I don't. His praise is not always on my lips. But why should we? The scripture tells us. I will praise him. My soul will boast in the Lord. I will praise him because of all he's done for me. I will praise him because he loves me. That, to me, is the answer. I don't know what your answer would be for that question, but that would be how I would respond. Why we should praise God continually, because God is with us always. I will be with you always, said Jesus, to the end of time. Acknowledge that. Know that. And praise God. And what are barriers to continual praise? That's a good one. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Pause it. Think about it. What are barriers to continual praise? And no, I don't mean COVID bubbles. And I don't think it means I can't get to church on Sunday because I'm working. What are barriers to continual praise? Well, for me, the barriers to continual praise the dark parts in my heart, in my soul, the fallen nature that is you and Glenn, the far from perfect being that I should be or try to be, that stops me from praising all the time. It's like going down the road and coming to a fork, and one fork of the road leads me to continual praise. Other fork, that's, that's something, oh, that's transient pleasures. I'll go down there takes me away from praise. Praise sometimes can seem a chore as if it's going uphill, so I don't really want to go this this other way of life, this easy way of life. It's a bit it's a bit easier to travel, so I'll just go down that way for a while. 
And I'm sure that's that that road is because the signpost there says God and evil. God and evil. And in my heart there's probably more evil than I'd like to admit. It takes me away from always wanting to praise God. I'll say, oh, I'm too busy. But you don't need to be praising God by going hallelujah, praise the Lord all the time. You don't need to be praising God by going, oh, our Father who art in heaven all the time. Good though that is. But just acknowledging God. Letting God into your heart rather than keeping the door. What did Jesus say? Stand at the door and knock. And whoever opens the door, I will come in and eat with them. Sometimes my door is locked and bolted. I don't want Jesus in my heart. I'm frightened what you'll see there. That stops me praising him. Thank goodness he doesn't go away. He doesn't stop knocking and, and I don't keep the door locked all the time. Because of my fallen nature. Because I'm not perfect. What does continual praise do to our spirit? Well, you've seen it in me already, I suspect, tonight. You've seen the way I'm feeling buoyed up by reading the scriptures, this joy, this acknowledgement, this thanksgiving. It's making me bouncy, it's making me happy, it's lifting my spirit. Praise does that. Acknowledging what God has done for you in Jesus Christ out of his love for you and his love for me does that. And if it doesn't, oh, I think there's something wrong. We should have our hearts lifted when we acknowledge what Jesus has done for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believe in him shall not perish but live forever. Surely that lifts the sprays, that lifts the spirit, that gives you cause to sing. At least I hope so. And how are you training yourself to praise continually? That's a question for you to answer and a question for me to think about. You know, you get to my age and stage in ministry and you think, oh, I've done it all. You think, I'll just keep going the way I've been going. I'm happy with what I am, where I am, what I'm doing. We've got to train ourselves all the time. We've got to train ourselves to, to praise God. Do you know, there are times when I have been doing these recordings. I think this is the fifth one. I have no idea if anybody's watching it. I have no idea if it's benefiting anybody. But it's benefiting me. It's making me think more about the scriptures. It's making me think more about God. And so I'm training myself and hope somebody else may be out there is watching it. I can understand it's a bit boring just to look at my face blethering away all the time. And that's why I say it's, it would be better in a communal setting. But we need to continually keep reading, exploring, worshipping, praising. And the more we do, the more we we'll want to do, the more we'll recognise the joy of God in our hearts. I've got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Well, down in my heart. Well, down in my heart. I've got joy, joy, joy. You know that one? Down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Because I'm happy. I'm so happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my soul. You know that's an old one. But it means so much. This continually praising. David and the authors of these psalms, they shared so much of our emotions, so much of our experience. And I've said to folk often in my ministry that if you're, if you're down, you'll find a passage in psalms that will say, look, even the holy people find that as well. And you'll find how they got out of it. Jesus would would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words from the psalm on the cross. And if Jesus can use the psalms, surely we can. I've enjoyed doing this study on the psalms 
as I said, as much for me, if not for you. And I'm going to close with a short prayer. Shall we pray? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you in all circumstances. In this past year of pandemic, we give thanks that you have been with us. That you have been in the hospital wards and in the care homes. That you've been with the bereaved and the sad. That you've been with the doctors and nurses and ancillary staff. That you have been with those working in science labs. That you have been with those politicians. Because you love each and every one of us. And you have been with us. And so we praise you. We thank you for your word. A word of complex ideas and comments. But through it all is your love for us. We thank you for that love. That love that the psalmist could exalt your name and lift you up high. Who would give thanks in every circumstance. Who would taste and see that the Lord is good. We give thanks for your love shown to us in the teachings of Jesus to love one another. A love that held him to a cross in pain to die for you and for me. We thank you for that love that conquered death and says to all who believe in him, do not die but live with him forever. Lord, we praise your name and our spirits are lifted when we acknowledge what you have done for us. So continue to bless us as we continue to explore your word. Be with tonight our families and our friends. Be with any who are going through times of difficulty or sadness or hurt. Reach out in love to them and reach out to love for us. For these prayers we bring to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, thank you once again for joining with me. And if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to drop me a note. Take care of yourself. Take care of others.